This extended preview features clips from a long upcoming episode on Valentin Tomberg and the occult replacement of Christianity. We're going to be talking in considerable depth about the new age replacement of Christianity. What do I mean by that? Well, let's begin with the fact that obviously across the West, Christianity is receding and it's being replaced. In many cases, it's being replaced by materialism, agnosticism, atheism, but in many cases, it's being replaced by something else, a very definite spirituality. And this spirituality, which often its adherents believe is a kind of universal spirituality, transcending all religions, owes a very great deal to the New Age movement that grew up in the Anglosphere especially in the 60s, 70s and 80s and has now become extremely mainstream. What we're going to be maintaining is that this isn't really a universal spirituality because we're going to be suggesting that it is in fact highly, highly Eastern. It owes far more than many people realize to the East, all right? And here I don't simply mean specific Eastern doctrines coming out of Hinduism or Buddhism. I don't simply mean specific practices like yoga or Reiki or you know other forms of Oriental healing. No, I mean something actually more essential and core than all of these things. And the way I'm going to suggest it to you right now is from a line, a couple of lines, that we're going to be taking from Valentin Tomberg's magnum opus. Tomberg warns of spiritual adultery, compromising one's spiritual tradition. And he suggests that we lose incredibly when, for example, we exchange a living God for an impersonal divinity, or Christ crucified and resurrected for a sage deep in meditation. I'm going to suggest to you that what Tom Berg is really getting at here with these lines about an impersonal divinity or a sage deep in meditation replacing Christ crucified and resurrected has everything to do with this new spirituality replacing Christianity above all in the Anglosphere. I think before we really, you know, shift into Tom Burke, I want to really name some of the really key points. So, theosophy. Theosophy is at the root of all of this. You know, it's not the only root, but it's a far more major root than people do realize. So, you know, I've tried to invoke different voices like Gary Lackman, you know, saying the mother of all modern spirituality, so-called, is Helena P. Blavatsky. We've been speaking about Blavatsky after she allegedly went to Tibet and then came to the West, came to the West and um, started the Theosophical Society in 1875. The Theosophical Society had a famous motto. That famous motto is, there is no religion higher than truth. You can see how that famous motto can make sense to people. They can sort of say, well, you know, religions are you know, intellectual systems designed to capture the truth, and um, surely the truth is more ineffable and ungraspable than any religion, and they won't necessarily notice that there is a sleight of hand going on there. What I would say the sleight of hand going on there, ladies and gentlemen, is that um, when Theosophy, you know, when Blavatsky pro proclaims there is no religion higher than truth, 
she's actually saying, you know, what's implied there is you don't need religions, you need the truth, and I'm going to give you the truth. Theosophy is going to give you the truth. Um, and it may not have occurred to the early theosophists, in fact, I'm sure it didn't, that theosophy becomes a religion. You know, there's a kind of um, theos theosophical set of dogmas that people subscribe to. Um, I'm including, yes, the idea of a universal spirituality that we're all headed towards, um, that transcends religion, um, without people ever realizing that what Blavatsky and Alice Bailey are really passing off is very Eastern. We're going to continue developing this. Um, people are buying in to um, a set of theosophical dogmas. I might call it theos theosophical orthodoxy. They think they've transcended religion, but really they just have another set of dogmas, um, another kind of religion, a kind of theosophical uh, orthodoxy. And I would say that there's also, you know, like a New Age orthodoxy. Brought up Steiner. Steiner is the founder of Anthroposophy, which was advocating an esoteric Christianity, so-called. I would say very much there's an anthroposophical orthodoxy. All of these things have this in common, that they think that they're moving us beyond, you know, ordinary religion, but they may well turn out to be religious systems in themselves with religious dogmas and religious orthodoxy. What I want to do now is come to this book. This book is a German book, Anthroposophy und Kirche, um, by Martin Kreeler. Martin Kreeler, we mentioned already, was close to Tomberg. Uh, Tomberg spoke about him as his second son. So Tomberg had a real son, but he spoke about Kreeler as his second son, and he bequeathed his literary legacy to him. So he left behind all the rights of his work to Martin Kreeler when he died. So Martin Kreeler was very clearly close to Tomberg. I've had a very dear friend of mine, a German friend, a native German speaker, has given me a translation of a very key passage here. I've occasionally referred to this passage before, I've occasionally quoted parts of it, but I've never read the entire passage out like this. Now it speaks of very, very serious things, ladies and gentlemen. I think before we dive into the serious things that this passage speaks about, uh, I do want to note, you know, it's obvious, but I want to make it clear. Um, this isn't Tom Burke himself. This is, you know, someone very close to him. But it's Tom, you know, Martin Kreeler reporting what Tom Burke thought. It's, you know, secondary material. Um, you know, this is not the same as, you know, Tom Burke's work itself. Occasionally, Kreeler writes, Tom Burke spoke of evil, in which he saw not only a lack of being, but very real powers, manifold and chaotic. One should not occupy oneself excessively with it. And this is, of course, what Tomberg says in his magnum opus. Um, but pay attention to evil, pay attention to evil, in the seductive form of seeming good. Its method of adopting something beautiful and half true, which deceives us and leads us unwittingly into evil. And yes, these thoughts about deceptively beautiful half truths are very relevant to everything I'm saying here. If people were afraid of evil occult groups and conspiracies, this was not principally unjustified. They did, in fact, exist. But most of the time, one did not understand how to localize them accurately. In fact, sinister occult forces had worked in Hitler's and Lenin's movement. He described to me the methods of working of the sinister counter-occultism, for example, 
Its influence on language, manners of speech, ideological forms of thinking, and the fostering of all sorts of enemy polarizations. Uh, maybe I say something there as well. Tomberg, and we'll be talking about this, is so gentle. And it has a lot to do with the fact that he does not want to foster enemy polarizations. Nonetheless, it doesn't mean that he doesn't believe that this sinister, you know, counter-occultism doesn't exist. And there are indications of plenty in, you know, his work, if you know how to look for them. Look around his work, you know, for example, notice what Tomberg says about the symbol um, of the circle of the serpent biting its own tail. He goes into this in great depth, this symbol of the closed world of the circle. And then notice how that very symbol is the symbol of the Theosophical Society initiated by Blavatsky. An ohm at the top, a swastika, and other symbols. At this point, a little interjection. I remind you, the viewer, that this preview is only an assembly of clips that are necessarily disjointed. The longer discussion has more context, subtlety, nuance than the perhaps sensational feeling these clips could evoke. Sensationalism is the last thing Tom Brook wanted. Still, he clearly discussed things like the symbol of the closed circle of the serpent for a reason, that we might meditate on them in a non-sensationalistic way. In this spirit, I offer further clips with things Tomberg obviously thought were important to say. I'm now going to dive into um, a passage where Tomberg really speaks about the Eastern Mahatmas, um, you know, who worked with Blavatsky. He also goes into masonry here a little bit, or he touches on it, and this is relevant to the material that we quoted from Martin Kreela. You know, the whole issue of who Blavatsky's Mahatmas were, Eastern Mahatmas, that she said, you know, were dictating her work. Um, she also claims that she met them. She met them in Tibet. She met them in the flesh. Huge topics here. Which Tomberg obviously takes the Eastern uh, Mahatmas of the Theosophical Society seriously here. Uh, that does not mean that the way they were, you know, represented to the world as, you know, dictating this text, telepathically transmitting this, this, that, and the other, you know, uh, this is not to say that all of this is real. It's beyond my competence to evaluate how much substance there is in all of this, but I do not think that Blavatsky was purely and simply inventing all of this stuff. Let's, let's say that, and you know, the enormous power of it, the enormous power that has changed the world far more than most people realize, um, testified to the fact that this isn't just the you know, single production of a Russian woman, Madame Blavatsky. There is far, far more going on here than simply Madame Blavatsky. But all right, um, look, we're coming to the text. The theme here is our Lord saying, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his home, own name, him you will receive. And Tom Berg is saying that there are two kinds of glory, the glory of the Lord, and another, another kind of glory, an other glory, and he has this other glory in inverted commas. So he says, the possibility of the other that's italicized, glory, i.e. the manifestation of mastership in one's own name, also exists. The words of the Master, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. State it clearly. 
experience in the domain of occult, esoteric, hermetic, Kabbalistic, Gnostic, Magical, Martinist, Theosophical, Anthroposophical, Rosicrucian, Templar, Masonic, Sufi, Yogistic movements, and other contemporary spiritual movements, supplies us with ample proof that the words of the Master, the words of Jesus Christ, have in no way lost their actuality. This is all going on today, seeking for another glory that is not the glory of Christ. Then he says, because for what other reason do the theosophists, for example, prefer the Himalayan Mahatmas, to the master who has never ceased to teach, inspire, illumine and heal amongst us and near us in France, Italy, Germany, Spain, to name only the countries where there have been well established cases of meetings with him, and who himself said, I am with you always to the end of time. A little note on that before we proceed. On this channel I emphasize a lot, my wife does as well, the visions of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in France. You know that Tom Berg, and we've spoken about this in other episodes, took completely seriously that our Lord Jesus Christ appeared in France in 1673 to Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque. Um, he speaks about this as necessary to save the world this appearance of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And, you know, his reference to Spain is no doubt, you know, uh, taking in mind, you know, the encounters with our Lord, with Saint Teresa of Avila, um, you know, who he also, you know, speaks about in the book, her visions of Christ. So he's saying that, you know, why do we prefer theosophy? when we have Christ. And it goes even more than this. Because he's speaking about the, the other glory, you know, glory in one's own name. And he asks, because for what other reason do the Theosophists, for example, prefer the Himalayan Mahatmas? And the suggestion here is, you know, he's not coming out and slamming you with it, is to suggest that there is a definite preference, you know, for one's own glory here, or he'll argue elsewhere in the book, or suggest elsewhere in the book, one's own power, one's own power, all right? That is strongly suggested here, that this is through all of these movements. He continues, For what other reason does one seek a guru amongst the Hindu yogis or Tibetan lamas, without giving oneself half a chance to seek for a teacher illumined through spiritual experience in our monasteries or spiritual orders. And he clearly means the monasteries and orders, you know, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. Um, or amongst lay brothers and sisters who practice the Master's teaching and are perhaps quite near at hand. And why do members of secret societies or orders of the Masonic type consider the sacrament of flesh and blood of the Lord insufficient for the work of building the new man. And why do they seek special rituals to supplement it or even to replace it? People are rejecting the Eucharist or feeling that it isn't enough. And he's asking, what is this really about? What is this really about? 
and he goes on to suggest an answer. All these questions fall under the heading of the words of the Master. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Why? Because for some, the Superman has more attraction than the Son of Man. And because he promises them a career of increasing power, whilst the Son of Man offers only a career of foot washing. You know, Christ washing the feet. And this is another theme in the book. You know, we can aspire to power, or we can wash the feet, and we can aspire to serve. We now return to a further clip from the Martin Krila passage. final paragraph here that I've got is now specifically speaking about Theosophy, you know, Blavatsky, and maybe, you know, he sees this as a separate current, you know, to the sort of currents already named. He took the occultism without Christ, which based itself on the Theosophy of Blavatsky and worked out of the Indian-Tibetan region very seriously. It was very influential from the background. You know, the New Age movement, all these things may not seem that obvious in the foreground, but things can be very influential from the background. It was, for example, partly instrumental in the spread of Bolshevism, in the benevolent neutrality towards it, in the threatening east-west polarization, but also in the esoteric youth movement of the new age, which began to flourish at the time. So yeah, uh, Martin Kreela knew Tomberg, you know, in the 1960s and early 70s, just before Tomberg died in 1973. And this is when this esoteric movement it's a youth movement, he calls it. The New Age began to really take off. And he's clear that Tomberg is linking this to occultism within the Indo-Tibetan region. We're going to be taking a deep dive into the esoteric and occult roots of the New Age you know, the New Age movement, particularly theosophy. The theosophy that was brought to the West, brought to America specifically by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky from Russia, where she founded in America, in New York City, in 1875, the Theosophical Society. We'll be also going into Alice Bailey, who was a follower of Blavatsky, and things like the Findhorn community a bit, in northern Scotland, um, which has been a key center for the New Age movement, to, see the, to say the least. Now, um, as those of you who know my work know, I do have some measure of qualification to speak about all these things, um, because I was a member of the Findhorn Foundation in Scotland for about three years back in the 1980s, and um, I was steeped in Alice Bailey, I was steeped in Theosophy. I was a Theosophist, and I've plunged very deeply into these things. What I do want to make clear, because I brought in this rather spooky sounding word, occultism, is that this really could be, you know, misleading certain people here uh, to think that I'm about to start speaking about dark satanic rituals and things like this. And no, I'm not. I'm not. The way the word occultism was used a hundred years ago, you know, in the kind of theosophy that we are going to be diving into, um, wasn't really about anything even remotely like that. You know, it was about being aware of the hidden forces of the world. That is what, you know, the word actually occult means, hidden. All right? But um, not necessarily, you know, for dark magical reasons.
Another problem here is that the whole thing that the New Age draws on, we'll be touching on this, has so many different currents that, you know, I can't say that none of this exists in the New Age, but the New Age movement that I'm going to be describing here is something that is largely free from that kind of um, aspiration. Um, really, the kinds of people, and I really want to emphasize about this, about the kind of New Agers that I knew at Fintorn all those years ago, you know, seeking the transformation of consciousness, um, the kind of New Agers that I've known in my life, uh, for the most part, are highly idealistic people. You know, often very kind, very sensitive, very caring, and they are seeking a better world. You know, why I went to Fintorn um, in the 80s, you know, I had no interest in, you know, dark occult practices. I truly believed that Fintorn was pioneering the way ahead for the world. And why I came to that kind of strange idea, you know, we'll be going into. Um, but yeah, um, this transformation of consciousness is much more often um, going to be about like things like, I'm putting this rather crudely, you know, the search for enlightenment or the search for psychological integration. I do really want to make that clear. All right. Um, you know, I do want to say that, you know, dark forces are everywhere. You know, they're in the Vatican. You know, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. So nothing um, I'm saying about, you know, the New Age being a place of, you know, searching for, you know, a kind of kind, caring society, you know, negates the idea that there are not indeed darker, murkier corners of the New Age. Um, but the New Age is about idealism. I did know, you know, to one extent or another, key people within the New Age movement in a strict sense. And I testify to this, so very, very much of this has to do with theosophy, more than people realize. Next point I want to say is, theosophy is Eastern. You know, Blavatsky's whole thing was a rejection of Western philosophy, Western thinking, you know, very much Christian thinking, obviously. Um, although she was quite anti-Semitic as well. Um, that was, you know, a whole rejection of the West. And, you know, when she spoke about, you know, no religion, you know, higher than truth, you know, this can really be seen as a, an attempt to move Christianity, you know, off the field, so to speak. And I would say the same about Alice Bailey. You know, there will be people who might be objecting to me, saying, well, Christ, you know, Alice Bailey, she's this English woman, and, you know, she speaks about the Christ and the Christ consciousness, and, you know, there are all kinds of Western terms there. We're not going to debate that right now, but you go into her, you know, syncretistic one-world religion that I was speaking about, and the plan is for the key festival, the center point of this, to be Wiesak, the day the Buddha was born, enlightened, and died. Alice Baylor's theosophy, variation of theosophy, even though it has Christian nomenclature, you know, it has Christian terminology in it, quite a lot of Christian terminology, actually, is also Eastern. It's drawing on these Eastern sources, you know, what, you know, you could call, as the theosophists have and done, esoteric Buddhism. I just want to make a note about um, another New Age text that has even more Christian terminology than uh, Alice Bailey, and I'm speaking about the very key text, channel text, A Course in Miracles. The, I read that the author of the book, Helen Sheckman, said she took dictation from Jesus. Now, I'm aware, uh, very well aware, that all kinds of people could object to my linking A Course in Miracles, you know, in with the East, in with Theosophy, and I can see why they would do that. You know, it doesn't have obvious links to the patterns that I am speaking about. I do actually think the links are there, but it's more than I will be able to unpack for you today. But anyway, yes, we have this um, very profoundly important, you know, channeled book, so-called channeled book from, you know, Jesus, so-called, you know, that has been 
so important to people like Marion Williamson, who then in turn influenced, you know, Oprah Winfrey, you know, again, bringing the same kind of Alice Bailey ideas. Uh, you know, these ideas include that what's important is not Christ crucified and resurrected, but Christ as a teacher, Christ as exemplifying something called the Christ consciousness. You know, all that, you know, we've touched on. But right now, in terms of A Course in Miracles, I want to run for you um, 30, 40 seconds of a man who teaches A Course in Miracles called David Hoffmeister. Now, I know very little about David Hoffmeister. Um, seems to me, you know, from the little I know, and I imagine he will seem to you as a kind, decent, idealistic person, as, you know, New Agers generally are. In fact, he's kind enough uh, that he says on his YouTube channel that, you know, people can use his content for free. So thank you, Mr. Hoffmeister. Um, I'm now going to run 30, 40 seconds of you, and then we'll comment more. There are many people who are Catholic, and they had a heck of a time with the Course in Miracles because the definitions that Jesus was bringing forth in the Course were so different. And, and sin had a whole different meaning, and, and the Holy Spirit had a whole different meaning, and the, it's like, they were like, oh, now I've got to unlearn my entire associations with all these words. Jesus and Buddha are both on the same wavelength. They're, they're saying the same thing, you know, come inside, let go, let go, release, keep coming. All right, I don't think we need to say too much there, you know. Christ is equated with, you know, the Buddha. There's no real sense here of Christ crucified and resurrected, bringing something new and different and far greater into the world than any pre-Christian spirituality. Indeed, the very thing that I have just said there would be anathema to New Agers. You know, the idea is, is can't you see? Can't you see? It's all the same thing. Christ consciousness, Buddha consciousness, you know, Gaia consciousness, it's all the same thing. Um, moreover, you know, this good man, you know, Mr. Hoffmeister, is speaking about, you know, suggesting Catholics need to unlearn, you know, the Catholic religion for, you know, the principles of A Course in Miracles that he clearly considers superior. And I have met all kinds of people into the Course in Miracles, you know, over the years with exactly the same ideas. I had the same ideas myself. You know, this represents a new dispensation for the age of Aquarius, uh, where Christianity is going to be transcended and corrected by texts like Alice Bailey and A Course in Miracles. You know, this is the superior teaching and the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels is misrepresented. This is what's going on here, ladies and gentlemen. And, you know, if I were to suggest that, you know, the kind of people I'm talking about here, or the kind of person I was, were, you know, victims of occultism without Christ. Victims, I say, you know, very kind, decent people. Um, well, I would just look crazy to them. And indeed, the person I am today would look crazy to the person I used to be. Look, this talk about victims of occultism without Christ, I'm very aware it may not just sound crazy. It may sound actually very hurtful or painful to even maybe some of my viewers. You know, you could be watching this and think, this is not just crazy. It's possible that it could hurt, you know, might make you even roll your eyes or throw things at the screen. You know, that's possible. Like, my Catholic viewers won't understand this, I think. But I have, I think, viewers, you know, who aren't Catholics, who've, you know, got the same kind of background I have. They might not be specific New Agers, but they've come to Tom Berg and they're reading him in that light, the same light that I used to do. And for me to suggest that Tom Berg is speaking about um, occultism without Christ could be, you know, really shocking. 
I do want to be sensitive here. People will feel that, even if they're not Christians, many people will feel that they are close to Christ. You know, it's in part because of the, the whole idea that I've been expressing, that, you know, if you really believe in a universal spirituality, and Jesus is the same as Buddha, how could you not have Christ? I do want to make some subtle precisions here before I go on, because this is the way that I used to think. You know, so I, you know, I'm very aware, ladies and gentlemen, you know, lines, you know, from the gospel. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Or, you know, when two or three are gathered in my name, you know, all kinds of New Agey type people like I was, are like invoking the name of Christ and gathered in, you know, his name. And for, you know, maybe some of my viewers, this just sounds really possibly um, heavy and inappropriate. It's something that I've had to think about many, many years because the question basically is raised here, what do we mean by Christ? You know, do we mean a kind of Oprah Winfrey Christ, where it's the Christ consciousness, and, you know, his death on the cross is not what it's about? Discover the Power Within You by Eric Butterworth, where he talks about the Christ consciousness. And up until then, I was like you, Marquis. I thought Jesus came, died on the cross, that Jesus' being here was about his death, when it really was about him coming to show us how to do it, how to be, yes. to show us the Christ consciousness that he had and that that consciousness abides with all of us. Yes. That's yes. what I got. Yes, that's, that's what I got. Yes, same time. Or do we mean something else by Christ? And it's like, if we're saying all the time Buddha is the same as Christ, you know, look, look, it's like, you know, um, I say potato, you say potato, I say, you know, Buddha, you say Christ, Let's not call the whole thing off because, you know, people of the mindset I used to have will say, these are trivial differences, Roger. You know, these things are all the same. And some of you, you know, maybe even watching this might say, how dare you? How dare you say this occultism is without Christ? How dare you? What I'm saying, what I'm suggesting, is that it is without Christ crucified and Christ resurrected. And as I hope we'll be making clear as we dive into Tomberg, you know, I think this is what Tomberg is getting at. You know, and I'm still aware, you know, because I had to struggle with these things for many years, that people could object with passages from Tomberg. Those of you who know Tomberg very well, you know, will really say that Tomberg is pointing to Christ transforming the world on Calvary. You know, and that transformation of the world ripples out everywhere. You know, so for example, there's a brief passage where Tomberg, it will sound very speculative to some of you, suggests that Mahayana Buddhism, you know, the Buddhism of I will not seek enlightenment until the last blade of grass is enlightened, is a change in Buddhism. You know, I'm no expert on Buddhism, but, you know, that, I think, captures the spirit of it. Forgive, you know, uh, I hope my Buddhist friends will forgive me if I'm getting too much wrong there. Okay? Um, Tomberg is suggesting that, you know, Christ, Christ changed everything. Christ changed everything. But he's not suggesting, he's not suggesting that Buddhism, even if Christ's, you know, transformation has changed everything, that Buddhism is the same as Christianity. No, he speaks about and he warns against spiritual adultery. Valentin Tomberg, I'm going to suggest, was indeed very concerned not only about spiritual adultery, but occultism without Christ, you know, without Christ crucified and resurrected, and without the change that this brings. You know, I'll just give you another example. You know, I have a new age, you know, man who I deeply respected for many years and I still respect 
a man of great integrity. He told me that he, you know, this is years ago, he'd seen Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, and he was appalled by it. For him, Mel Gibson's Christ was clearly like old, distorted, well, rubbish, you know, from the age of Pisces. His Christ was the Alice Bailey Christ, and, you know, what A Course in Miracles means by the Christ. So we have this situation where all kinds of people, thanks to Oprah Winfrey, thanks to Marianne Williamson, thanks to A Course in Miracles, thanks to Alice Bailey, are speaking about a Christ that is very different, very different from the Christ of the Gospel and the Christ of Christianity and the Christ of the Church. You know, and there's certainly a tendency in theosophical and New Age circles to look at Christianity as though it were all rather dour. You know, those Christians are obsessed with morbid ideas of original sin and suffering and a crucified Christ. And again, yeah, they associate this, and this follows Alice Bailey, with um, the outgoing age of Pisces. Um, in my view, such people um, are trying to have their cake and eat it too. Because on the one hand, they're rejecting Christianity, key parts of what Christianity is, such as original sin, such as the crucifixion. They're describing it as outmoded, atavistic, passe. And then they turn around and claim that uh, their universal spirituality um, embraces, fully embraces Christianity. You will find all kinds of people of the kind of uh, mindset that I once participated in, you know, I probably said such things myself, who would say, you know, I'm not against religion. I'm not against the church. You know, um, you know, my universal spirituality embraces the church, and I feel, you know, very warm towards Christianity because I would assume that I had the same thing. I wouldn't have thought that Christianity gave you anything different. And what I'm really concerned about, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have now a new age replacement for Christianity, where all kinds of new age people unconsciously and innocently assume that they have Christianity. They have the essence of Christianity um, under the umbrella of their universal spirituality. So if I'm saying occultism without Christ, I'm referring to occultism without Christ crucified and resurrected. And I think that was, would have been, you know, what Tomberg, what Tomberg was speaking about when he spoke to his friend Martin Kreela about this. And yes, I confess to a certain degree of somberness, ladies and gentlemen. Somberness not only about the world situation, but really what this new age replacement of Christianity is costing us. I think it's costing us mightily. You know, we're going to be coming to Tomberg, you know, suggesting that we lose. We lose. We lose greatly when we substitute Christ crucified and resurrected for a sage deep in meditation. Spiritual adultery is therefore the exchange of a higher moral and spiritual value for a lower moral and spiritual value. It is, for example, the exchange of the living God for an impersonal divinity, Christ crucified and resurrected for a sage deep in meditation. And he goes on, you can read it yourself if you want, but a sage deep in meditation. There is a lot hinted there, ladies and gentlemen, if you know about the Eastern meditative practices, and you read the book in conjunction with what else he has to say about Eastern sages 
plunged in meditation. And in a sense, you know, these Eastern sages plunged in meditation. You can honor things that they are with, but what they are with is not the same as Christ crucified and resurrected. And it's not the same as the new world that Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, gives birth to through his crucifixion and his resurrection. You know, I've just spoken about being somber. Some people might hear me and they might think I mean depressed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if any thought like that is going through your mind, I'm not depressed. I'm alive with this. And this is also, this is also key uh, to, you know, seeing the difference between Christianity and New Age spirituality. In the New Age, there is so much about being upbeat, 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 or at least being serene and detached. Christ crucified is suffering with the world. The crucified one is suffering with the world. And we join, we join in that. It's a very key difference between, yeah, the spirituality of Christ crucified. Yes, Christ resurrected as well. But Christ crucified and resurrected. And the spirituality of, you know, the smiling Buddha, transcendent, a sage plunged in meditation. All right. But yeah, I'm somber. And this very key difference entails the divergence between Christianity filled with personal love and pre-Christian spirituality, which tended towards depersonalization. Tomberg is referencing these words from the St. John Gospel, where Christ says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. And Tomberg writes, there is a profound mystery in these words. Indeed, how may they be understood alongside numerous other sayings of the Master? He means our Lord. Referring to Moses, David, and other prophets who were all before him. Now, it is a matter here not of theft and robbery, but of the principle of initiation before and after Jesus Christ. So he's pointing here in his esoteric language, again, to everything changes with Christ. The masters prior to his coming taught the experience of God at the expense of the personality, you know, the detachment, the serene, aloof detachment of the East, becoming impersonal. I speak about this in my books. I speak about it in other episodes. The Eastern path that I was on was leading me to become more and more impersonal. The masters prior to his coming taught the experience of God at the expense of the personality, which had to be diminished when it was seized by God or immersed in God. He has some of that in quotes, but you need to read it to really, really um, grasp this. In this sense, in the sense of the diminution or augmentation of the talent of gold entrusted to humanity, the personality, which is the image and likeness of God, the masters prior to Christ were thieves and robbers. And he has a quote here from um, Goethe, the highest treasure of the children of earth is surely the personality. Goethe is saying something completely different from the Buddha. Goethe there is not expressing Buddha consciousness. And he goes on to say that, you know, before Christ, you know, there were those who certainly bore testimony to God. But the way which they taught and practiced was that of depersonalization, which made them witnesses, martyrs of God, 
the greatness of Bhagavan, the Buddha, was the high degree of depersonalization which he attained. The masters of yoga are masters of depersonalization. The ancient philosophers, those who really lived as philosophers, so, you know, going back to Greece here, practiced depersonalization. This is the case, above all, with the Stoics. And this is why all those who have chosen the way of depersonalization are unable to cry and why they have dry eyes forever. For it is the personality which cries and which alone is capable of the gift of tears. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I've spoken about this before in my writings and I think in the videos as well. The eastern path that I was on was robbing me of the capacity to weep the capacity to mourn, to, 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 to mourn. You know, I have a, a video on this channel called How Catholicism Made Me Human. And it's, it's about this as well, how the sacraments of the church, you know, reawakened my humanity after this process of Eastern depersonalization. The master, again, he means our Lord, Jesus Christ, also says, I have come that they, the sheep, may have life and have it abundantly. In other words, the Master has come in order to render more living that which is dear to him and which is menaced with dangers, i.e. the sheep as the image of the personality. I'm going to stop reading that, ladies and gentlemen. You know, yes, it's bringing tears to my eyes, and maybe you would have to have my background, my background in theosophy, my background in Alice Bailey, to really understand why it's bringing tears to my eyes. But passages like that worked to free me, to free me from theosophy, and to liberate me from New Age ideas, like it's all the same. Buddha Consciousness, Gaia Consciousness, Christ Consciousness, it's all the same. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not all the same. Jesus Christ made all things new. Behold, I make all things new. And you cannot conflate pre-Christian spirituality, you know, even great figures like Plato, Aristotle, you know, you cannot conflate this with the love, the love, the love that Jesus Christ's birth, death, and resurrection brings into the world. Um, I will just say something uh, about my own journey here that has been in this episode. Uh, clearly, the second half of my life has been very different from the first half. You know, the first part of my adult life was completely devoted um, to this theosophical work at the heart of the New Age movement, at least the New Age movement, in the strict sense of the term. And being liberated from this, um, I owe more than I can possibly say to Valentin Tomberg. I think that his work, his magnum opus, is, as I say, it has many, many goals, this book. But one of the goals is to deal with um, theosophical occultism, this Eastern occultism, and the book worked to liberate me from it. I think I should also give credit where credit is due to Rudolf Steiner. Obviously, Steiner's legacy is very problematic for the church, not least of all, you know, because Steiner himself was so tragically uh, critical of the church. But you can still be grateful for where you got help. Um, Steiner also Steiner's faith in Christ crucified and resurrected as changing the cosmos. Steiner's rejection of the theosophists. You know, um, he had been a theosophist himself. He claims that he was only ever a theosophist in the hope that it could be Christianized. And when he realized that this Eastern theosophy could not be Christianized, he left. 
I want to say that maybe also, you know, there will be people, I think, watching this in time to come who will be, you know, very much, you know, in some way or another um, influenced by the same kind of Anglosphere, New Age, theosophical currents that I was. They might find it very hard, you know, I found these issues very hard for years. Um, and yeah, I think it's worth noting for those people that Steiner also very clearly rejected theosophy, you know, for reasons that are very much in the territory of what we're speaking about today. So, so much could be said about what we're speaking about now. Far more could be said. Really, it's my books that I speak about this the most. And I am going to bring up for you here the most recent book, My Gentle Traditionalist Returns, because it's entirely relevant to all of this. Um, not only the sort of fiction part of the book, which is something like 190 pages of the book, but it also has another 50-page non-fiction afterward, which is about all the things we're speaking about. You know, Theosophy, New Age, and Tomberg's response to it, also Steiner's response to it, is in that 50-page afterward. But the fiction part of the book is relevant as well, because what a lot of people don't realize about my, you know, fiction books is that they're really, the fiction in them is really like an excuse um, for the ideas, and the ideas are mainly presented in dialogue format. Yes, my latest book, which you can find at my Amazon author page, link down below, features an in-depth dialogue, plus a long afterward on these very themes to do with Tomberg, Steiner, Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, and the ongoing assault on the Catholic mystery. But, in addition to this book, there is, of course, also my long upcoming episode, Valentin Tomberg and the Occult Replacement of Christianity, coming soon.